The nature of conflict in the First World War was completely different to what it had been 100 years earlier. Had you witnessed a battle during the Napoleonic Wars in the early 1800s, you would have likely seen organised rows of soldiers in brightly coloured uniforms, firing single musket shots every 20 or so seconds, separated from the enemy by only a short distance. A hundred years later, in 1914, however, the nature of war had changed completely. From 1914 to 1918, armies, amassed in the millions, brought powerful new technologies into battle with them. Machine guns, tanks, heavy artillery, chemical weapons, aircraft and submarines all played their part in the catastrophe of the First World War. These weapons were the product of countries that had shaped their entire nation and economy towards military goals, and it was this process that we refer to when we talk about militarism. Militarism is the belief that a country should use its military power to achieve or expand its national interests. Only by improving the size, organisation and capacity of a nation's military could a country hope to protect itself from its enemies. As we will see in this video, the spread of militarism across Europe played an important role in the outbreak of the war. So what did militarism look like in Europe at this time? And what were the three key ways that this made war more likely in 1914? The first and most basic thing to point out here is that all six major European nations – Britain, France, Italy, Germany, Austria, Hungary and Russia – all increased the size, capacity and power of their militaries in the decades leading up to the First World War. By looking at how much money each of these nations spent at this time, this point becomes really clear. In 1870, these nations spent a combined total of £94 million on their militaries. Thirty years later, in 1900, this had risen to £268 million, and by 1914, an astonishing £398 million was being spent by these European countries. While all these countries increased their spending at the time, Germany stood out in particular. In the years leading up to war, from 1910 to 1914, France increased her expenditure by 10%, Britain by 13%, Russia by 39%, but Germany increased her spending by an enormous 73%, and the result was the creation of massive armies. By 1914, the size of European armies had risen to unprecedented heights. Britain had the smallest army with only 710,000, followed by Austria-Hungary with 810,000, Russia with over a million, France with 1.25 million, and Germany with 2.2 million. So how had these countries been able to produce such massive armies? The answer, in a word, was conscription and all major countries with the exception of Britain introduced conscription in the years leading up to the war. Conscription meant that young men of fighting age were forced to serve in their country's military for a specific period of time, and this enabled European countries to create armies on an unprecedented scale. The increase in the size and power of all the major European armies at the same time was not a coincidence. The great powers of Europe had many reasons to be suspicious of one another, but these tensions increased in particular from the 1870s onwards. In the 40 years before the outbreak of war, each time any one country decided to increase the size of their military capacity, it tended to make other countries, particularly ones close by, increasingly nervous. The only logical response seemed to be to ensure that you were able to match your opponents in battle. And it was this process of the competitive increase in military power that we refer to as the arms race. One of the most famous examples of this competition was the naval race fought between Britain and Germany from 1898 to 1912. Britain and its massive empire relied to a great extent on its ability to control the seas. As a result, it had, over the course of the 1800s, built up a massive navy. In 1897, however, Germany appointed an ambitious new admiral, Alfred von Tirpitz. Tirpitz wanted to create a navy capable of rivalling the British, and therefore began to increase the size and scale of the German navy. Britain responded and before long a naval race had begun. 
In 1906, this race was intensified following Britain's invention of a new and much more powerful ship, the HMS Dreadnought. The Germans soon followed creating their own version of this ship. So in the years before 1914, both Britain and Germany were spending millions in order to win this naval race. So we can now see that all major European nations were increasing the size of their military, but how did this make war more likely in 1914? There are three key ways in which militarism made war more likely. First and most basically, militarism increased the tension between the powers of Europe. One of the reasons Europe divided into two opposite camps at this time, the Triple Entente and the Triple Alliance, was because of a growing awareness that each country's military would not be powerful enough to fight on its own. Secondly, the enormous increase in the size of everyone's military resulted in a growing expectation that war, if not quite inevitable, was certainly likely. And one of the important consequences of this belief was the creation in every major country of specific plans in the event of war. These military plans would have major consequences in 1914. One plan in particular was important. In 1905 to 1906, Germany's military leader Alfred von Schlieffen was tasked with devising a plan that would ensure Germany would be victorious if war were to break out. Schlieffen recognised that Germany was in a difficult geographical position, with key rivals France and Russia situated on its western and eastern borders. If war was to break out, Germany would be forced to fight these two powers at the same time, and a battle on two fronts would be very hard to win. Schlieffen then came up with a plan specifically designed to prevent this situation. If Germany was to win a European war, they needed to defeat one of these countries as quickly as possible. The problem, however, was that France was already paranoid about a German attack, and they had, as a result, made great efforts to make the border that they shared with Germany as strong as possible. Germany's plan, therefore, devised by Schlieffen in 1905, was to avoid crossing this border altogether and instead used the great majority of their army to head northwest through the Netherlands and Belgium and invade the far less well-defended northern French border. This, it was hoped, would lead to a rapid defeat of the French forces and the remaining troops would be able to turn and fight Russia in the east. And it was this plan that was put into action in 1914. The problem, however, was that the plan involved crossing Belgium. Belgium had a long military alliance with Britain Entering into Belgium risked bringing Britain into the war against Germany. In summary then, the impact of these ambitious military plans was to increase the likelihood that a conflict between any two nations could lead to a much larger European war. The third effect of militarism was in changing the mentality of Europe's leaders. While militarism had clear physical consequences, such as the drawing up of military plans, the final effect was of a more psychological nature. Militarism not only created a physical pressure for war, but also a mental one. As European countries developed ever more powerful armies and navies, military leaders began to have more and more control over politics. The rise of military leaders increased the pressure on politicians and helped spread the idea that war was not only inevitable, but actually desirable. The idea that war was glorious and heroic was, of course, not new, but ever since the publication of Charles Darwin's Origin of Species, a new view, known as social Darwinism, promoted the idea of survival of the fittest. According to the survival of the fittest, countries were viewed as animals locked in a battle for life and death, and this mentality, while less obvious than other factors, helped prime the key decision makers in the summer of 1914 with the idea that a war to determine the future of Europe had to be fought at some point, perhaps sooner rather than later. Thanks for watching this video. Hopefully you found it useful. If you did, please like and subscribe and we'll see you next time.